Hi guys, we're going to talk about chapter 22 and this is going to really focus in on substance related and addictive disorders. So when we think about substance use disorders, these are not disorders of choice. They are very complex diseases of the brain that are usually characterized by cravings, seeking, and using regardless of any consequences. Continued use can actually change the brain structure and function. Substance use disorder is the pathological use of a substance that leads to, to a disorder of use. So let's just get started here. When we think about substance use disorder, these are um, symptoms that are grouped together. Um, they usually have impaired control, social impairment, risky use, and some of the physical effects that we're going to get into are intoxication, tolerance, and withdrawal. So all of these groups are going to have all of these symptoms. Substances that can lead to use disorders um, can fall into, remember, um, four major groupings, that impaired control, social impairment, risky use, um, and again, those physical effects. And the ones that we're going to look at are listed here. Alcohol, caffeine, cannabis, hallucinogens, inhalants, opioid, sedative hypnotics, stimulants, tobacco. And we don't want to forget that gambling is also a very addictive process. So it can also lead to a disorder. So some of the concepts central to addictive use disorders, um, we can talk about addiction, and that's defined as a primary chronic disease of brain reward, motivation, memory, and related circuitry. They are typically with that addiction unable to abstain from whatever substance they are addicted to. And they're real, those people are unable to really recognize any functional problems that may be going on. Without treatment, addiction is progressive and it can lead to disability or death. Intoxication is that excess use of substance. Some of the terminology um, can vary depending on the substance that you're using. So anyone using substances may be considered under the influence. Alcohol can cause intoxication or cocaine will make you high. So some of that terminology is just a little bit different depending on the substance that's being used. When we think about tolerance, an individual no longer responds to the substance in the initial way that they responded. So they really need more of that substance to feel the same response. Withdrawal, we have symptoms that occur with when one stops using that substance. So each substance has its own characteristic withdrawal symptoms. We unfortunately know that the more intense the symptoms one has, the more likely the person is going to start using again because the withdrawal symptoms are so bad, they're like, nope, I'm not doing this. This is too bad. I'm just going to get back on my substance again. So as far as epidemiology, the National Survey on Drug Use and Health Survey is conducted annually. Participants are typically 12 years and older, and they're randomly selected for an interview. Then based on this data, they can see about 165 million people use substances within that last month. The actual number of people with substance use disorder is about 20.3 million, and that includes about 15 million with an alcohol use disorder and about 8 million with an illicit drug disorder. So this again is our epidemiology. You can see um, Note the past year's um, substance use disorder. This came from a 2018 study. And you can just see um, the differences in the numbers there on which substance was used more heavily. As far as risk factors, we can think about genetic factors. Substance use disorders such as cannabis, cocaine, and opioids typically run in families. 
As far as neurobiological factors, the major neurotransmitter involved in developing substance use disorder are the opioid, catecholamine, and GABA symptom systems. Sorry. Um, as far as environmental factors, poverty raises the risk of an unfavorable living environment, lack of parental supervision, poor educational resources, and really an impaired support system. A cycle of negative environmental events often begins with disadvantaged neighborhoods, increasing stress and anxiety, along with a lack of negative social ties, which really contributes to depression. So the environment is really a high risk factor, um, depending on um, kind of that patient's unfortunate poverty level. So here's our clinical picture. We're just going to go through each of these and we're caffeine so caffeine is the most widely used um, psychoactive substance in the world why do individuals use caffeine as an addiction it increases your alertness and it decreases your fatigue right i'm sure all of you or most of your coffee drinkers i'm not a coffee drinker i'm more of a giant mountain dew drinker um but if i'm tired right i can hit one of those up and it kind of increases my alertness and decreases that fatigue so I can keep going. Um, this really is an official use disorder, but it can still result in intoxication, overdose and withdrawal. So when we think about caffeine intoxication, this usually occurs with greater than 250 milligrams of consumption. So those of you that have those high energy drinks, that's two of those and then you can have that intoxication feeling. Some of the behavioral symptoms that you might notice are restlessness, nervousness, excitement, maybe that rambling speech where you just are talking super fast. Some of the physical symptoms might be a flushed face, maybe diuresis, GI disturbances such as kind of nausea, belly aches, and tachycardic. High doses can cause grand mal seizures, respiratory failure, and even death. So a lot of people don't think about caffeine in that way, but understand really high doses can be very serious. When we think about caffeine withdrawal, this is um, associated with um, medical problems, <clears throat> excuse me, and there's really no intervention that's needed. Symptoms can occur within 12 to 24 hours after consumption and the peak is usually about 24 to 48 hours. Symptoms could include headache, drowsiness, maybe some irritability. So I think if you can think about that time, um, if you've had that time or opportunity to maybe cut out your caffeine um, in about a day or two, I know I've experienced it. I start getting that headache, I get a little more irritable because I'm, I just have that little bit of addiction to that caffeine. When we think about cannabis or marijuana, this is the most widely used drug in the world. It is legalized in some states synthetically for the use of nausea and vomiting that is associated with chemo for cancer. Um, more states are becoming more widely open with cannabis. Um, so you just have to know which of those states is widely using it. Other synthetic cannabinoids, um, our K2 or spice can be associated with toxic doses. It is the fourth most commonly used psychoactive drug in the US after caffeine, alcohol, and nicotine. Cannabis intoxication, um, we can think about the heightened sensations. Sensations are very, very heightened. They see things in brighter colors, new details of common stimuli, time seems to go much more slower and motor skills are impaired for about eight to 12 hours. Cannabis withdrawal typically occurs within about one week of cessation. Some of the behavioral symptoms that we might see are anger, irritability, maybe some anxiety. Some of the physical symptoms may include abdominal pain, sweating, fever, chills, and even headache. As far as treatment, um, abstinence and support is our main principle. We can think about individual, family, and group therapies to help provide support. We also need to just be aware as healthcare providers, 
that drug screens can detect cannabis for up to four weeks after use. Hallucinogens cause a very profound disturbance in reality. There are two categories. We can think about classic and disassociative drugs. The first one is, that we're gonna talk about is our classic, which are hallucinogen um, classics, which are LSD. Um, so other terminology might be acid, maybe boomers. Um, significant psychological and behavioral changes occur with this when they're on this. Paranoia, illusions, maybe some hallucinations even. Some of the physical symptoms that we could think about are pupillary dilation, tachycardia, sweating, and tremors. And treatment is usually trying to just talk that patient down, reassuring them that the symptoms are going to subside. Um, sometimes in severe cases, we may have to administer Haldol or Valium in very short-term periods. Um, disassociative drugs um, for hallucinogens are, are P PCP, um, otherwise known as either Angel Dust, Sherman's, Zoom, or some of the other uh, lingo that I've heard of. Um, it, this is a medical emergency. Um, if you're in a PCP intoxication, your patient is in a medical emergency. That They could result in very violent side effects. They could be very belligerent. They could be very assaultive or impulsive. As far as treatment, these patients typically are unable to be talked down. So we will have to restrain most of these patients that are in a PCP intoxication. As far as hallucinogen withdrawal, there's no official withdrawal diagnosis. Um, they will re-experience symptoms wh um, while intoxicated. So that re-experiencing of perceptual symptoms may actually prevent normal function for weeks, months, or even years. Inhalants are the are toxic gases that are inhaled through the nose, our mouth, and then enter into our bloodstream. Common household products include solvents for glues and adhesives, propellants, maybe paint spray, aer or paint spray aerosol, hairspray, shaving cream. Some of our thinners might be paint products, correctional fluid, and then fuels is the last one, gasoline and propane. So these are all different um, items that people can inhale in order to get that high feeling. It can cause failure in major life roles and interpersonal relationships. Cardiac arrhythmias um, is a is a big thing. Um, they can have that sudden sniffing death, right? They sniff something, they inhale something, they go into a cardiac arrhythmia that could actually cause death. Inhalant intoxication really depends on the substance, but generally they're going to have that disinhibition, disinhibition and euphoria. They may have some fearfulness, illusions, auditory and visual hallucinations, impaired judgment, impulsive, aggressive, and some of the physical symptoms that you might see are nausea, anorexia, diplopia, stupor, unconsciousness, and amnesia, especially in some very high doses. As far as treatment, there is no treatment. It's self-limited. Um, they will come off of that high in a few hours to a few weeks, again, depending on the substance. Everyone has heard about opioids, um, especially the opioid misuse, um, particularly heroin or prescription drugs. Um, and this is a chronic relapsing disorder. So our patients get an opioid because they have a craving for it. That craving, um, they become tolerant to it. So they need larger amounts, which just increases our tolerance. And it's this vicious circle that our patients can go through. It can cause very significant life roles and interpersonal impairment. As far as opioid intoxication, drowsiness to coma, slurred speech, impaired memory, pupillary constriction, impaired judgment and social functioning, and we, but we can give naloxone IV to relieve some of those toxic effects. When we think about opioid withdrawal, this occurs after cessation of heavy use. 
Symptoms may include um, mood dysphoria, GI symptoms, muscle aches, fever, insomnia. Other classic symptoms include lacrimation, rhinorrhea, and then pupillary dilation, right? Because we're coming off of it. Um, morphine, heroin, methadone is usually a six to eight hour after the last dose um, with one week of use when we're coming off of it. Um, Meperidamine or Demerol is usually eight to 12 hours to about five days for that withdrawal. Over Opioid overdose, um, death usually results from respiratory arrest due to respiratory depressant effect of the drug. Um, so we're gonna really need to do a lot of respiratory support and then give that naloxone. As far as general treatment, um, individual family behavioral therapies can be helpful in managing use. Pharmacological treatment is methadone, buprenorphine, and naloxone. Um, the methadone just decreases those painful symptoms um, of withdrawal. Sedative, hypnotic, and anti-anxiety medications. Um, so these can include <coughs> our benzos, benzo-like drugs, carbamates, barbiturates, and barbiturate-like drugs. It could also include our club drugs, sorry, club drugs, like um, the date rape drug. Um, it can also include prescriptive sleep medication and maybe even anti-anxiety medication. The craving is a typical feature with significant tolerance and then withdrawal can develop once they stop taking it. As far as intoxication, we're going to see symptoms like slurred speech, impaired thinking, coma can be a very dangerous possibility. When we're thinking overdose treatment, gastric lavage, um, is what has to happen. We have to get that um, substance out of their system. So we'll use that activated charcoal, monitor the vital signs, and get that substance out as soon as we can. Withdrawal really, again, depends on the degree and timing of the specific substance. Um, a treatment could be a gradual reduction of whatever the substance is to prevent seizures. Um, so especially with our benzos, we want to just gradually reduce those benzos. Stimulants, uh, cocaine, coke, crack, snow, blow, sniff, whatever you want to call it, and other amphetamines, uh, crank, ice, speed, uppers, um, are what we're talking about when we're thinking about our stimulants. This is the second most widely used drug. Euphoric feeling and high energy, they feel much more awake, they're super alert, they're confident, and they're very energetic. Increased use plus cravings plus tolerance equals, of course, your decreased function in those major life roles. Stimulant intoxication, they feel superhuman. They are elated, they are euphoric, and they are very sociable. Unfortunately, they are also a hypervigilant sensitive, anxious, and also tense. Some of the physical symptoms we may see, they may complain of chest pain, they may have high or low blood pressure, tachycardic or bradycardic, respiratory depression, weakness, confusion, and maybe even coma. As far as stimulant withdrawal, um, that usually begins a few hours to days after they've stopped the substance, and it can include fatigue, they may have very vivid nightmares, depression, and then that's where suicide may come, play a role in this, is that withdrawal. As far as treatment, um, inpatient uh, setting is usually necessary. Individual family group therapies can be helpful. Antipsychotics are useful in treating agitation and hyperactivity, and our antidepressants may be prescribed once they've gone through that withdrawal period. So I just really liked this box in your book. It talks about um, the stimulant intoxication and short term what's going on. And then as they're withdrawing off of it, you can see some of those symptoms as well. So I think you can see as they withdraw, um, if they're becoming more anxious, more irritable, right? They may just be like, this isn't worth it. And they just get back on that substance. Um, so that's where um, those withdrawal symptoms can be very um, indicative of why they continue to keep going back to it.
tobacco. These are cigarette cigars, can be smokeless, can be snuffed or chewed. Um, cravings, the persistence, recurrence, and tolerance are all symptoms. Um, dependence can happen very quickly with these substances. Cigarettes are the most widely used. Intended effects are usually for relaxation, decreased anxiety. Some of the long-term effects can be on the cardiovascular and respiratory systems. Smokeless can affect the, that oral mucus, mucosa though. As far as tobacco withdrawals, um, again, they can be irritable, depressed, difficulty concentrating, maybe even restless. This can happen days after cessation. Um, the heart rate though, once they do have that cessation, um, can decrease five to 12 beats um, per minute. Um, within that first year of quitting, a lot of times our patients may gain four to seven pounds. So again, that might be the reason why they get back on it. Um, as far as treatment, we can do behavioral therapy, um, recognizing those cravings. We can also think about nicotine replacement therapy, the patches, um, gum, things like that. All right, so let's move into a little bit of alcohol. Um, this is usually a sedative creating um, an initial feeling of euphoria, usually related to decreased inhibitions. Um, severity is really based on the number of DSM-5 symptoms. So if we have mild um, alcoholism, um, it's going to be two to three symptoms on that DSM-5, moderates four to five, and then severe is five or more. So when we think about alcohol use disorder, there are um, two different types of problematic drinking. Binge drinking refers to drinking too much alcohol too quickly. Heavy drinking is characterized by drinking too much too often. Eight or more drinks in a week constitute heavy drinking for women. Men who drink more than 14 drinks in a week are considered heavy drinkers. So what is um, a standard drink? Standard drinks are defined per National Institute of Health as any drink that contains about 0 0.6 fluid ounces or 14 grams of pure alcohol. So you can see that each of these drinks pictured are different sizes, but each contains approximately the same amount of alcohol, and that's what's considered a standard drink. When is drinking in moderation too much? So if we're drinking in moderation, but now we're borderline too much, um, maybe we're taking a medication that interacts with our alcohol. Maybe we're managing a medical condition that can be made worse by drinking. If you're under the age of 21, even in moderation, that's too much for most, uh, or for all states. Um, if you're recovering from alcohol use disorder, even one drink is too much. Um, and then obviously if you're pregnant or could be pregnant, then drinking in moderation is too much. So alcohol intoxication, um, these are symptoms that are based on the blood alcohol level. 80 to 100 um, mg's per DL, or the 0 0.08 to 0 0.10 is our um, blood alcohol um, limit um, or above limit. So if we're thinking about um, two drinks, um, that's that 20 megs per dill, 0 0.02 is our two drinks. We may see some slow motor performance, maybe a little altered mood, maybe that euphoria is in play, um, but we will have some decreased thinking. Three drinks, you can see there is 0 0.05. We have impaired judgment, again, more euphoria, maybe some lower alertness at this point. Four drinks is gonna put us at that lower limit of our blood alcohol content, 0 0.08. Altered speech, impaired judgment, poor self-control. Five drinks puts us at 0 0.10. Slurred speech, poor coordination, slowed thinking. And then if we are having more than five drinks, 
would just have that potential of the 0 0.40 impaired vital signs and, and even possible death. <clears throat> According to the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, men consume more than four drinks on any day or more for the 14 drinks per week. For women, if it's three drinks per day or more than seven drinks per week, um, then we're concerned about that heavy drinking. Alcohol withdrawal, um, tremors, shakes, lack of appetite, nausea, vomiting, increased blood pressure. Um, you could see those about eight to 10 hours after cessation. And then as far as withdrawal seizures, this can occur 12 to 24 hours after cessation. These can be tonic-clonic. Value may be given. Um, when we think about withdrawal, withdrawal delirium, this is a medical emergency. This could happen within the first 72 hours. Delusions, hallucinations could result in very unpredictable behavior. So we need to protect themselves from what they believe are genuine dangers. How can we treat those deliriums? Um, diazepam Valium for agitation, tremors, hallucination. Um, that'll help keep those patients, or sorry, chlordizepoxide will help keep our patient out of danger. So alcohol withdrawal can be very serious depending on um, how heavy of a drinker they are. So just being aware of that. The other thing um, I just want to talk about is Wernicke Korsakoff syndrome. This is cognitive disturbances that can happen. People um, with heavy use of alcohol can suffer from short term memory disturbances. One reducing memory problem is Wernicke's alcohol encephalopathy, which is an acute and reversible condition, usually characterized by altered gait, vestibular dysfunction, confusion, and ocular motility abnormalities. When we think about Korsakoff syndrome, this is a chronic condition with a recovery rate of only about 20%. So the patho really behind those, these two problems is a thiamine deficiency because of poor nutrition associated with alcohol use or malabsorption of nutrients. Treatment um, for Wernicke, uh, or sorry, Wernicke will respond rapidly to large doses of IV thiamine two to three times a day for one to two weeks. Korsakoff is also treated with thiamine for about three to 12 months. Um, so just being aware of that cognitive disturbance syndrome that you can get with um, over alcohol use. Fetal alcohol syndrome is um, unfortunately the leading cause of intellectual disabilities. So this is alcohol during pregnancy that just inhibits that uterine growth and postnatal development. We can see microcephaly, craniofacial malformations, limb defects, and even heart defects. And so I just grabbed this picture from your book. Um, you can see some of the different facial malformations that can be seen. Um, that you can recognize pretty quickly um, for a baby that may have fetal alcohol syndrome. As far as systemic effects, um, peripheral neuropathy, um, they may complain of pins and needles in that lower extremity because of numbness. Alcohol myopathy is decrease in muscle mass, or they may have a lot of muscle weakness. Alcoholic cardiomyopathy is again that decrease in muscle tone around the heart. They can have fatigue, shortness of breath, maybe some edematous legs and feet. Esophagitis is, uh, comes from vomiting. Gastritis is that nausea and vomiting. And then pancreatitis is severe abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting that usually will subside with cessation. Alcoholic hepatitis is that inflamed liver. Um, a lot of times genetics can play a role for, with that. As far as cirrhosis of the liver, this is progressive. Eventually to non-functioning liver, you can see jaundice, ascites, leg edema. Leukopenia is that decreased WBCs due to cirrhosis. So we have to um, really um, indicate to our patients that cessation is their best um, alternative. Thrombocytopenia or low platelet counts due to, again, to cirrhosis. Bruising, petechial rash, prolonged bleeding can be a problem. And then we have noticed that cancer 
especially of the head and the neck, breast, liver, and colorectal um, can come as a systemic effect with um, alcohol use disorder. So let's apply the nursing process. So when we think about the nursing process and we talk about assessment, there are several screening tools that we can think about. The first one is SBIRT, screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment. This really identifies at-risk substance abuse patients for those early interventions. The other, your book also listed audit, which is an alcohol use disorder identification test. Um, CAGE, there's four questions that can identify alcohol abuse, and those four questions are listed in your book. CAGE ID and then TACE are other screening tools. So when we think about assessment and we've done our screening tools, um, we're going to assess for, uh, we're going to assess the family <coughs> as part of our assessment process. We want to evaluate the individual holistically, background, pattern of abuse, are there any mental health symptoms, and then we're going to look at that family assessment and codependence. So codependence is that the family exhibits overly responsible behaviors, the individual self-worth of caring for others to the exclusion of their own needs. So um, if you're um, purchasing alcohol, um, you're, you're canceling plans because you think your spouse is going to get intoxicated and they may need you, that's being codependent. Um, so please understand what codependence means, um, especially with um, alcohol use disorder. Um, Self-assessment. Um, alcohol use is self-inflicted, and the nurses should really be careful assessing personal thoughts, opinions, and feelings, right? Why don't you just stop, right? This is self-inflicted. It's an addiction. They, a lot of times they can't just stop. So making sure as nurses that we're really assessing um, our own self um, thoughts, opinions, and feelings. Um, once we've done our assessment, we're going to identify some of those outcomes um, and then start planning. And a lot of that's going to be immediate detox and stabilization, abstinence if they're actively drinking, what's their motivation for treatment, um, and then making sure that all of those are essential to that patient-centered. As far as implementation, we want to promote safety and sleep. That's the first line intervention, um, safe environment, observing for those withdrawal symptoms, reorienting them back to time, place, and person, and then allowing them to just get a really good restful sleep. Reintroducing good nutrition and hydration, severely compromised nutrition due to choosing the substance versus sustenance. Um, we wanna help support body systems and that neurological function. So they may be very malnourished because they've chosen their substance over food. So reintroducing that good nutrition. So we wanna support their self-care and hygiene um, this is going to increase their self-esteem um, because they've probably neglected themselves for a long period of time. And then we want to make sure we're obviously exploring any harmful thoughts um, and spiritual distress, making sure our patients are safe. Some of the health teaching and health promotion that we can consider um, prevention against genetic vulnerability. Remember, genetics accounts for about 40 to 60 percent of someone's risk. Prevention may be the best answer, right? So if you know you have a risk of um, opioid use, um, prevention needs to be the best answer. Teach the patient to recognize indications of relapse or factors that could contribute to relapse, encouraging communication techniques, going to public classes. Um, those 12-step programs, especially for our alcoholics, um, can be very helpful. And then after we've done our full nursing process, we definitely have to evaluate those interventions that we've implemented, assess the effectiveness of that treatment plan, making sure we're using objective data to check whether those nursing actions worked. Some of the treatment modalities, pharmacotherapy focus on treatment for alcohol use. Um, the first one there is disulfiram or antabuse. Um, so again, that's for use for maintenance, relapse, prevention, aversion therapy for alcohol use disorder. Um, naloxone, again, um, or sorry, that's not naloxone. Naltrexone is withdrawal, relapse, prevention, D 
decrease pleasurable feelings and cravings if we give that. And then the last one is our benzos, and that can just help with our withdrawal. As far as motivational interviewing, this is an approach based on the trans theoretical or stages of change therapy or theory. It has gained popularity and use as a brief, long-term and supplementary intervention, particularly in treatment of substance use disorders. Um, it uses a person-centered approach to just really strengthen the motivation for change. As far as care continuity, Continuum, continuity of care occurs through a continuum. So when we think about detoxification or detox, this is when an individual quits using the substance. They're gonna think about rehabilitation, medically monitoring an with an inpatient program. Short-term rehab um, has lo learns lost skills. Long-term rehab learns new skills. As far as halfway houses, these are residential treatments. Um, extended sobriety, getting a case management assistant, in integrating new life skills back into their rep repertoire. Um, other housing, we can have community reintegration. That's not really part of their treatment plan. Partial hospitalization are those intense treatments without 24-hour care, five days a week for six to eight hours. Intensive outpatient treatment are structured, scheduled treatment groups. Outpatient treatment is the least intensive form of treatment, and it's really based off of that individual's needs. And then Alcoholics Anonymous, um, we can think about um, Alcoholics Anonymous, that's that 12-step program. Individuals learn how to be sober through support systems. Most areas have around-the-clock meetings. Al-Anon are for friends and families that are worried about someone with a drinking problem. Alateen are peer support groups for teenagers who are struggling with the effects of someone else's problem drinking. Naranon are, are family and friends who are concerned about addiction with drug problems, um, not related really to alcohol. And then Gamblers Anonymous is also another group that's out there. Relapse prevention is the last care continuum, right? We wanna make sure that we are preventing them from relapsing. Advances in technology have expanded options for maintaining long-term sobriety. Applications for smartphones, for example, offer a way to monitor behavioral patterns for relapse cues. And that concludes chapter 22. If you have any questions, you can shoot me an email or we will chat about it in class. Thanks guys.